I want to call the budget committee meeting to order. Mikey, I presume we have quorum? No, I actually think everyone is here. I just wanted to get it on the record, that's all. Thank you. Before we begin, this is going to be an interesting meeting. Our last meeting, the Strategic Planning Committee, was about looking forward and looking to the future with some predictability and some expectations on where our universities are going to go and where we're going to go as a system. Another leg of that predictability and another important leg of being able to know where we're going to go is our appropriate and predictable funding. We're going to talk about that at length today. And today is, particularly on the budget side, all about priorities. As we're going to hear from Tim and our staff, we've got some serious challenges facing Florida and facing our state university system in this budget cycle. And we've reached a point in this state where we can no longer do more with less and certainly can no longer do more with less in higher ed. The, the cuts that we are taking now and the actions that we're going to ask our universities to take today are starting to get we're beyond cutting to the bone and we're, we're starting to cut off limbs. So we, we've got to take a different direction with regard to our decisions and make certain that we focus on quality over quantity, <coughs> frankly. So as we have these conversations today, as we listen to the report from staff with regard to the state and as we consider motions, um, know that these are going to be tough decisions that we're going to have to make, but these are tough times and we're going to have to step up for the students of Florida and make certain that we continue to provide a quality education. That said, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting? And a second, I'll take. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. And opposed. Thank you. Let me ask Tim Jones to step up. He's going to brief us on Florida's financial outlook and other budget issues. Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we do have several things we want to go over today. We're going to start with the governor's recommended budget that came out last week. We'll talk about the financial situation. Uh, then we'll go into appropriate predictable funding, and then we'll wrap up with some very exciting regulations. Why don't we do the exciting uh, Last Thursday, the governor released his recommended education budget. And in your packet, there is a manila sheet of paper that shows the board's budget that was submitted last fall with the governor's recommendation to the right of that. On page one is the E&G core budget. And you'll notice on the slide here we recommended an increase of about $68 million in our core budget, including funding for 3,600 students and some other initiatives that the board had. All of these were in the board's office, in the board's uh, budget request, except for the last item, which is $130,000 for financial aid funds. This is to replace the money, that, uh, not recurring money we received during the special session last fall. He did not recommend a tuition increase, as everyone is aware. And then on the, on the back side of that paper is the special units and state initiatives, and we broke that into, um, you know, this is your IFAS and, and your medical schools. We wrote it into one column for comparison purposes. He is recommending here two planning money for UCF and FIU, and the uh, continued funding for the FHU Med School to replace the non-recurring funds. Um, that is all of his recommendations for, for special units. And other initiatives, he's recommending $145 million. $75 million of that is for our Cortellas and major gift matching programs. And what he's doing is going to ask this board to determine how those funds would be allocated between those two initiatives. He's also recommending $60 million for Centers of Excellence, which is double what the board requested. And finally, he has in the budget, it's actually not in our budget, but the Department of Environmental Protection budget, $10 million for the Ocean Energy Research 
program at FAU. Any questions on the governor's recommendation? If not, we'll turn. Sure. I, I have not had any discussions on specifics with the governor's office on that program, and I don't know if anyone from FAU is here. They could tell us about that or not. But it's not in the education budget; it's the environmental protection budget. Is there no one here from FAU? Uh, may, may I speak to this, Mr. Chair? Yes, I, I don't have specific information on the in response to your question. But I think that we should recognize the fact that Governor Christ has made a statement about the importance of the state university system and that Governor Christ and his staff have really worked hard to find incremental resources for us in a context of a profound difficulty that as Governor Pettis has uh, talked about. So. In the first instance, I am relieved, and I think our presidents are relieved, that the governor recognizes that we have the capacity to lead the state out of the out of the difficulty, and that it can't get out of the difficulty without a strong university system. So I will get the answer. I will get the answer to the question. Um, uh, Governor McDevitt, but I do think it's very important for us to acknowledge, first and foremost, that this is a very positive step. It, it for has the state nothing University to do system. with that, uh, Chan Mr. Chancellor. I mean, my there was a Center for Excellence on that topic, which we approved year before last. I'm trying to determine the relationship. That's all. I'm not. I'm, I'm very happy to have the money, but I'm just trying to figure out if it's part of that Center for Excellence. Um, so they've got multiple sources. That's fine, but uh, that was all the question was. There's certainly no criticism of that. Okay. So, Chancellor, if you can find that out, perhaps in I an email will. Or, or something. I certainly will. Unless we can find that out before the meeting this afternoon. That would be I'll great. I'll see what I can do. Dr. Chase. Jim, could you just tell me why there's such a big discrepancy between lines 54 and 58 when these should be, um, um, I would assume, would be agreed upon figures? If the increase in state support needed with no tuition increase and the increase in student tuition report. Line, line 54, talk about the 293 million. Yeah. Is what the board had asked for in state support. Oh, okay. And the sixty-two million is what the governor okay, is so recommending. This is the mandated by line by line increases. Yes. Thank you. I also will point out that the governor's entire budget will be released on February fourth, so there'll be a lot more details um, available at that time, especially in other sectors of the budget. Right now, he's only released the education portion. Any other questions for Tim with regard to the governor's proposed budget? Seeing none, thanks, Tim. Please continue. Okay, next, we're going to move to a, an overview of the state fiscal situation. And we're going to start at a very high level and then kind of drill down as we go along. So the state has several revenue streams that can really be lumped into two areas trust funds and general revenue. Trust funds are where the revenues are deposited for specific purposes for initiatives. Um, two areas that we're familiar with include lottery revenues. They go into the Education Enhancement Trust Fund. And you have gross receipts tax, which goes into the PICO Trust Fund. The trust funds make up about 60% of the state budget. And the other source is general revenue, which is about 40% and includes basic sales tax, corporate tax, stock stamps, and so forth. And on page nine in your agenda, both the behind the budget tab, there's a further detailed list of the different types of taxes that make up general revenue. And the legislature gets all of those revenues 
and puts them in the trust fund or, general, or in the general revenue pot, and then they allocate those out to the different agencies or entities. Trust funds go to areas such as health care administration, um, Department of Environmental Protection, and so forth. General revenue goes to agencies such as Department of Education, health care administration, children and families, and other agencies. And in your packet, there's in your um, orange folder, there's a page on a piece of white paper that at the top says Senate Bill 2800. And about halfway down, you'll see a circle around operating and fixed capital outlay, 2007-8 original appropriation. And this is from the General Appropriations Act. It's at the back of the bill. And at the bottom, you'll see education listed. And then as you go over towards on the columns, you have general revenues, your first column, lottery, PICO, tobacco, other trust funds, and then a total. So you can see for education how much each sector received. You see universities, about $2.5 billion in GR, $245 million in lottery, and $979 million in trust funds, which is really the student and other fees trust funds. If you flip over to the back page, you can see other entities or agencies that receive state funding. Right at the top, underneath Section 3, Human Resources, and you look at the different agencies, how much they get from general revenue, how much from tobacco, other trusts, and so forth. If you go all the way down to the bottom, then you see where the total GR for operating a fixed capital outlay was about $29 billion. So and that's the pot of money that the state is struggling in keeping its revenues up. So all of these agencies and entities that receive general revenue are having to deal with the shortfall in the state's revenue collections. The state has a revenue estimating conference that meets twice a year to project what type of revenue will be available. They generally meet in the fall prior to the governor's budget recommendation coming out. And they also meet in the spring as the legislature begins working on its next year's budget. Now this is going to show what the Revenue Estimating Conference has projected in terms of revenues for their last three meetings. And let's go back to March of 07, which is about 10 months ago. And they had recommended or had projected about 30, $31 billion in general revenue. For the next three years, they had projected that to grow almost $34 billion. So that's what the legislature built their 0708 budget on, was that March estimating conference. If you don't recall, in July, we got notice from the governor's office and the legislature to develop a 10% budget reduction plan in anticipation of the shortfall. That revenue estimating conference, which is made up of economists from the legislature and the governor's office, met again in August. They reduced the 0708 revenue picture by a billion dollars. They also reduced the next three years' estimates by similar amounts. The legislature held a special session in October to reduce the state's budget by a billion dollars, equal to that August estimating conference. But then about three weeks after they had their special session, there was a November estimating conference. Once again, for 0708, they reduced the available general revenue by another billion dollars. <coughs> for 0809, it slid even further by a couple of billion. Likewise, in 910 and 10 <coughs> in December, excuse me, in 0708, you'll see the red bar is the estimated expenditures for the state 
for this fiscal year. Can you compare that to the November estimating conference revenue based on the numbers in November? There is available revenue to cover this year's expenditures, but it would not leave much of a surplus at the end of the fiscal year. Now, the legislature also does a three-year financial outlook each fall, and that financial outlook takes the state's base budget and projects basic growth in health care, corrections, and education. And for the university system, they include basic enrollment growth, funding for the two new medical schools, the matching gift program, and plan operations and maintenance funding for facilities. Now, there are three-year projections shown by the purple bar in OA09 is over $31 billion, growing to almost $35 billion in the year 2011. So that's the projected state needs over the next three years. Compare that to the available revenues that they're estimating. There's no way to be able to cover the state's basic needs. So if they end up with an $800 million surplus at the end of this year, they have problems meeting uh, next year's basic support and going out 10 11 a $4 billion deficit just to cover the basic needs of the state. And we all know what's happened nationally in, in terms of the economy. Um, Florida started feeling these effects last summer. Um, you know, home prices have been falling. You know, here in Florida, we're affected very heavily by the housing market. Population growth has started to slow, and we've seen that over the last couple of years in K-12 enrollments, which have been basically flat after growing for a number of years. Um, Florida's unemployment rate is starting to increase, and here you can see how it's been inching up over the last six months, getting closer to the federal unemployment rates. And as the economy worsens, we all know that our citizens look to return to school to further their education retool themselves. Um, just in the SUS, our graduate enrollments are up 6% this year. Community college enrollments, which are heavily predicated on the economy, are up about 6% after having a couple years of basically flat enrollments. Now, earlier I mentioned that the legislature uses the spring estimating conferences to build their budget. Here you can see the last nine spring estimating conferences. So the anticipated revenues for 0809 is about $27 billion. And this is the lowest it's been, you know, going back for five or six years. And you look at the last three or four years um, as almost an anomaly where we received over $31.7 billion in 0607 about $31 billion in those 708. So what kind of generated a lot of this general revenue? We had seven hurricanes over a two-year period that really spiked our construction costs, home sales, and there was a lot of creative financing out there because dock stamps were off the board during those years. So now it looks like we've kind of come down to a more normal growth pattern. And if we hadn't had that little anomaly in the last three or four years, Maybe this is where we would have been anyway, just considering the normal growth in the state's general revenue. Um, here's a summary of the general revenue for each of the state sectors, education, health and human services, and so forth. Before the special session last fall and afterwards, you can see there was a cut in general revenue to about 800, by about $800 million. There was a total of a billion dollars cut, and the rest of that came from trust funds. Education gets about half, a little more than half of the general revenue. Education took a little more than half of the reduction. Now, this shows um, for November and December, the revenue collections compared to the November estimating conference continued to decline. 20, uh, in November, Collections were down $22 million in December. They're projected to be about $76 million down, so a total of $100 million over the last two months compared to that November estimate. 
the only bright spot appears to be corporate income tax, but I understand that their submission of taxes is generally three or four months behind their actual collection, so we may not see a decline in corporate tax until later on this spring. So that $800 million surplus that the November estimating conference projected that we would have at the end of this fiscal year is already down to $700 million based on these collections and could drop further if revenues continue to decline. About three weeks ago, the House legislative staff made a presentation to the House Policy and Budget Council to talk about the 08-09 budget situation. This kind of walks through what House staff are at least thinking of in terms of the impact to the 08-09 budget. Assuming there was a beginning balance of $800 million, which we know now is not going to happen because of the declining revenues, in a revenue estimate of $26.9 billion, just to fund the base budget will cost about $26.6 billion. That would be nothing new added to the state budget. Then they would set aside some amount of money for reserves, which would leave them with a $100 million balance in 08-09. And they never like to cut it that close because of things that might happen. They also identified what they called must-fund issues of about $2.2 billion. Examples of those must-fund issues included increases in Medicaid, public school enrollments, impact of prisons. They also assumed that the constitutional amendment on property taxes next week would pass, which would impact public schools at about $160 million for next year. And the legislature is on record saying that they would make that up somehow. So that's factored into the must-fund issues. So that would leave them with a $2 billion shortfall in revenue for 08-09. So how are they going to make that up to be able to fund all these must-fund issues? Either through new taxing sources, which we haven't heard anything about those, or further cuts in the budget in trying to reallocate existing dollars to these must-fund issues. So how has all that impacted the SUS? Last fall, we took a 3.6% recurring cut. There were some non-recurring dollars added back at about $25 million, which resulted in a $58 million reduction for the current year. Universities adjusted service tax. They reduced travel, purchasing, froze positions, all in an effort to survive that cut. Now, in December, and this was after the November estimating conference, we got word from the governor's office, who is responsible for releasing cash to agencies. And in turn, we released that cash to the universities. They told us right before Christmas that in anticipation of further legislative budget reductions, they were going to hold back about 3.8% of the university's cash, along with all the other agencies. So it wasn't just universities, but every entity that received GR. Now, this 3.8% holdback is being felt by the universities right now, because they're receiving less cash monthly from the state. So if the legislature follows through on the 3.8% reduction, you're talking about another $90 million cut in the third and fourth quarter of the fiscal year. In your packet, there is a blue sheet that shows the impact by the university. We have the universities running down the left-hand side, and then the first three columns is the impact of all special session cuts. So for the University of Florida, the total U.S. recurring cut was about $22 million. They received about $5.4 million in one-time non-recurring funds for a net cut of $16.7 billion. If the legislature would take action on the 3.8%, they could receive another $23 billion cut for a total of $40 billion this fiscal year alone. So 
$90 billion is, is a significant amount of money any time, but to have it double whammy in one year is kind of unprecedented uh, for the university system. But $90 billion, just kind of put that in perspective, it is equal to about 15,000 students. Tim, you're saying billion. You mean million, right? Um, yes. Yep. Hmm. About 15,000 students. Or it's equal to about 900 faculty. One five or five zero students. Fifteen thousand. One five. Okay. Fifteen thousand. So obviously universities will be making probably these kinds of reductions, but there will be impacts depending on how their you know, uh, campus can handle these. And we already have indication from FSU on having to lay off a couple of hundred people uh, with a hundred of those being faculty. So the impact will be handled differently among the universities. But if you look at the total for the year, if this goes through, now if the legislature doesn't take any action at all, we'll eventually get all that cash released to us by the end of June. But we expect them to take some type of action in early March to address the situation. But for, the, for this year, we, could, we would have a $157 million cut, and that would become a recurring cut of $172 million in 0809 because we wouldn't have that non-recurring dollars to offset that. And this doesn't even take into account um, inflation. You know, our original budget, original core budget that we started out with at the beginning of July was about a 4% increase over the previous year. The first round of cuts kind of cut that in half at about 2%. If we take another round of cuts, so we're kind of back to where we were in 06, 07. Then if you start adding inflation into it, you know, the university's purchasing power is going to decline. We're looking at a 7% cut to the university's budget. Comes a nine percent cut if you start looking at our funding for students. And this is what our funding for student is where we are now for 0708. If we take another 3.8 percent reduction, we'll always be back to where we were in 2003-04, not even as low as it was back in the early to mid 90s when we also had budget issues. maintain our current enrollments, we have to lay off faculty, and we'll see our faculty-student ratio starting to increase. Um, we're already at the bottom, so we're obviously not going to get any worse in that area. We'll still be at the bottom. So now we start talking about quality and how that's going to impact our system. When you look over since 1990, our budget for the university system has increased about 200%. But inflation and enrollment growth has increased about 300%. Florida, if you look at all of higher ed, including community colleges and universities, we have the lowest total revenues per student of all the 50 states. But yet we continue to have above average graduation rates, and we continue to stress on the universities for quality improvements. So there's at some point where there's a tipping going to happen in terms of quality versus our funding. Are we there yet? I don't know. Uh, will we be there? That's really kind of hard to say. Um, and finally, the last slide, there has been an impact to your board general office. We had received two new positions this year. We had those taken back from us in the fall, along with $300,000. If we take another 4% cut in the spring, we'll lose five more positions. Currently, we have five vacant positions because we've lost a couple of people over the last two months. We've held those positions vacant in anticipation of cuts. So we could end up losing seven positions and about $600,000 this, this year. So our ability to respond to various initiatives could be compromised if we continue to lose more staff. And Mr. Chair, that concludes an overview of the budget. Thank you, Tim. You are a ray of sunshine. Uh, <laughs> let me just open discussion with the board. Is there any questions for Tim, comments, or discussion? We, uh, obviously, we've got some serious issues. Uh, that we've been pushing the universities for years to do more with less, 
Um, we've asked them to do the same with less, and I'm not certain we can continue to ask them to do that any longer without seriously impacting quality, if we haven't done so already. That student-to-faculty ratio number is staggering, um, that we are dead last by a lot. If you go back to that slide, there's a pretty good gap there. Tim, could you just space back a, a one slide? I mean, there is a substantial gap there between us and 49. So uh, that is an unacceptable. Uh, Governor Pappas? I agree that the numbers are telling, but th there's no there's no articulation of results in the in the student fact. I don't know how to uh, digest this information. In other words, it is who's right above us? We're right next to California. Okay, and we think the California system's a good system, right? I gather. I mean, that's the sense I get. So the. Certainly, this is telling us something about the, the ability to, to provide quality education for students, but I'm, I'm trying to understand how do, I, how do I digest that ratio as a measure of quality education? Is there another metric that we could add to this that would make it a little more enlightening? Well, um, and I may have Nate talk a little bit about that too, but if you all, we also kind of compare ourselves to North Carolina. In North Carolina is over to the left at about 22, 23 students per faculty. So it's instruction is delivered different ways in different states. And we, we talk more about being uh, more on the North Carolina model than we do about the California model. And I'll, I'll ask see if Nate wants to address the quality issue. While we wait on Nate, uh, President Medi. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Governor Pappas, I think we have to look at apples and apples and apples and oranges. California has a giant factory to produce the people that are going to be the wheels that grind the state forward. That is California State University System. California also has the University of California System, which is a research university system, which is the best uh, public university system in the world. So you would have to really disaggregate that and find what the University of California system is versus the California state. In North Carolina, you have one system. Uh, so I think to make an appropriate comparison, you'd like to compare to the California system and compare it to the Cal State system. I think you'll find tremendous differences, you know, in those two. That's, that's helpful. I mean, that's the, the kind of thing I'm trying to understand is it because it, it's just not all digestible, is it? And you'll find that, that we are way behind the University of California system, but we are better uh, than the California State University system, where there are no PhDs produced and uh, there's very little research done. President Hitt. This is one of those areas where, um, if we're honest with one another, we, we have mixed feelings. If you look at the empirical data on the relationship between student learning and class size, there's not an overbearingly clear relationship. There are some courses that can be taught very well and effectively to large numbers of students. There are others that can't. Uh, obvious examples, my own home discipline and psychology, you can teach intro psych to big classrooms of people and they learn pretty well. Try to teach uh, uh, keyboard uh, to more than one or two people at a time and you're not going to be very successful if you're music problem. Uh, those are extreme examples. But uh, the, the thing that you, you run up against is that uh, if we're going to care about these national rankings, they place a premium on student faculty ratio. Now, I don't think, for instance, that the U.S. News ranking tells you a whole hell of a lot about quality. But there are a lot of people who, who do. And so if we're going to be, if we're going to care about that, we have to acknowledge that there are, there are measures like student to faculty ratio that are determined by budget. And you can't win that argument if you're going to get within their frame of reference and by their metrics, we're not going to do very well as a system until we can address the student to faculty ratio, among other input-driven measures that they use. 
Mr. Uh, Deacon. Yeah, one additional point. Uh, there are full-time faculty, which are what are used, according to Tim, to calculate these ratios. Then there are adjunct faculty. We in the state of Florida have been pushed more and more. Let's say a regular faculty member uh, might cost $60,000 a year uh, and teach three courses, even uh, the, the very, very heavy load, four courses. So four courses, you hire an adjunct at $2,500 times four, that's 10,000 per semester. Two semesters is 20,000. You have just saved yourself $40,000. You've been forced, in some cases, to save that. So when you take a look at what's really going on in our institutions, you'll find 20, 30, 40% of the faculty being adjuncts, and those are not included in these calculations. So if we were to redo this number and look at the number of adjuncts, collapse them into full-time equivalent faculty, you will get another number. So that's another, you know, complicating, you know, dimension. Sir. Governor Roberts? Just this uh, information, when you increase, uh, uh, President McPhee, when you increase the number of adjuncts, which we know the reality of the right. budget, we've had to do that, and this board is dedicated to a quality system that's competitive with any system, with any university, and, and I know that you are too, all of the presidents are. How does the this is a generalization because there are many adjuncts that are excellent. But how does that affect the quality? Um, in general, we have less control over the commitment of adjuncts to our students. We have less control over the quality of the education, the collegiality, the integration. In other words, education suffers on many, many uh, counts. Adjuncts, we have, I, I know of one adjunct that teaches in three different institutions in South Florida. How committed can he be, you know, to our particular institution? So there are adjuncts who students tell me are the best professors they've ever had. But on the average, if you have a choice, you would want to have full-time faculty who do also adjuncts. Very few of them do research in their disciplines. You would like to have faculty that is in contact with the most advanced ideas so they don't teach you yesterday's or the day before yesterday's ideas, but today's ideas. So in general, except when you have the foremost leader in international law in the country teaching a seminar in our law school, uh, and the students get a tremendous benefit, but in general, relying on adjuncts is synonymous with lowering the quality of your education. Now, as a follow-up, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it, I believe that most students, or maybe not students, but most parents believe when they send their child to a university, and we know how, how for many people that, that's hardship in their family, that they believe they are getting the quality faculty member that you describe as your full-time faculty member. Nate, did you have anything to add? Um, the, uh, the comments that President Medik made are, are right on point. This, this number is not intended to be a, class, a substitute for class size, but more an indication of the size of the, the core faculty of the system in relation to the students. And the way that Florida has gotten to have the, um, the, the cheapest, or we could call it the most efficient, higher education system in the country uh, is by relying very heavily, both in the community colleges and the universities, on adjuncts on the one hand, uh, in the case of the universities, on graduate students, and by increasing class size as well. So all three of those things are kind of built into this. And the question is not whether we should be doing some of those things. Obviously, you can have an excellent university and with adjuncts and graduate students and uh, some large classes. It's a question of how far you want to push that business model. And this is how far we've pushed it. Other questions or comments? Is we, we, we need to deal with this issue. We, we need to have some concrete direction to our universities and some concrete proposals out there, but we're simply not doing our job. I mean, we, we have some challenges to face. Governor Martin? I guess the question for uh, President McBedeek, you kind of raised an interesting issue there with the adjunct professors. So for, the, uh, for your university, uh, FIU, how many adjunct professors would you say you have versus full-time? We have about 900 full-time, about 400 adjuncts, but the adjuncts may only teach 
one class, so you collapse them down, it's like 150 additional faculty. Uh, but 150 additional faculty, if you can save yourself 40,000 per 150 times 40, you're saving yourself millions and millions of dollars by hiring adjuncts. And we, we have been, that we have gone in that direction, not out of preference, but because of budget restrictions. And I think uh, uh, you'll find that that is not that uncommon, particularly in urban universities. And these NASDAQ professors, are these full-time, say, uh, employees of other institutions or in the business sector that are teaching part-time? Well, it, it varies. Sometimes uh, it's a distinguished uh, lawyer that appreciates the interaction with students and would like to teach a one-credit seminar on his particular tax specialty or international. Some, a, a number of our adjuncts live from the business of being adjuncts. It's a tough life because you have to teach a tremendous number of courses to get even thirty or forty thousand dollars. Governor Temple. Yeah, as a uh, uh, business guy, and particularly involved in real estate, I uh, sit on the national board of a national home building company and some others. I mean, we started 18 months ago uh, using that as an example to uh, start cutting back operations. Um, and I think, you know, it is, it's been on, it's a handwriting that's been on the wall, and I know, and I'm not trying to micromanage up here, but I think we have been kind of slow getting ahead of the curve. I mean, it, this has been on the wall. We've been able to predict this, and we need to really be serious about this because it not only is a, is a real decline, and we can, the state gets their, a lot of their revenues from related to the housing industry, there's no question about it. And it isn't going to turn around anytime soon. Uh, I think just like in my business side, I think we need to be looking at, we haven't talked about it here, uh, and I don't think we should dictate specifically how we do this, but, but I think everybody needs to be looking at the branch campus expansions that they've done, analyze them, make sure that they make sense and they don't make sense, they ought to come back. Uh, one of the questions I had raised a month ago, you know, using kind of an absurd example, but still an example, I'd ask, you know, what, what, if I was running a university, why wouldn't I just, uh, uh, just let in all out-of-state students because uh, we they're paying, you know, two, three times the tuition that we have. And somebody mentioned to me that there was a cap. And so I've explored that. I guess, Nate, you might want to comment on that. But my understanding of that cap is it's not a state legislative cap of 10%. It's a system-wide, uh, self-imposed by the original Board of Regents. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yes, the, the cap is a... Uh, uh, Board of, now it's the Board of Governors rule. Um, we're, the fact is that we're well below the cap, so the, the tenure yeah, we're well below. So it's, it's not really. It's, it's been. It was an issue maybe 15 years ago, but but our out-of-state enrollments have been uh, declining pretty steadily. Right. So I think that <coughs> ought to be on the table. That ought to be looked at. Clearly, our goal here is to educate Florida students, but given the unrealistic uh, situation we have particularly with in-state tuition. I think that ought to be on the table. I'm not going to tell you what it should be, but I think it ought to be on the table. And we have the right, as I understand it, this board has the right to change that cap. Uh, the other thing that's been a uh, thorn in my side, and I wrote a memo a year ago, is about tuition in some of our graduate schools. Uh, I that. have at the last minute brought that uh, letter I wrote, or memo I wrote, um, and of course, it boiled down to focusing on the law schools, where there's I think 81 law schools, and we're we're from 60 on down in terms of charge of tuition, and it's not a it's not you know it's not nurses and it's not <laughs> teachers, it's lawyers, uh, and I think all of those graduate programs, I'm happy to hand it out again if anybody wants it, because I I had my secretary make make a bunch of copies, but. I think that ought to be on the table, and I, I would hope that all the universities are looking hard at their graduate tuition because we can we control that. And, uh, you know, we're not in a, a, a lawsuit over that, as I understand it. Now, I under, also understand that the Board of Governors did uh, devolve this to the various universities. 
but I'm not convinced sitting up here that we're really that we're really kind of going through that because we need to look for any kind of money, any kind of additional revenue generation we can get. Um, kind of finally, uh, the chancellor had sent out uh, a memo to all the governors, and I'd like to move the following motion, three motions. You've all had it, uh, and but let me read it again. Uh, so I move that the Board of Governors direct each institution of state university system in Florida to align its student enrollment with budget cuts, faculty reductions, and reduce state appropriations. And there's a motion from Governor Temple. Was you want to take one at a time? One at a time. Can, I, sure. and can you read that again? I don't have whatever you're looking for. Okay, the board, our board, the Board of Governors, direct each institution of the state university system of Florida to align its student enrollment with budget cuts, faculty reductions, and reduce state appropriations. There's a motion. Is there a second? Can I hear a second? Yeah, second. Oh, okay. Governor McDivitt. There's a motion and a second, Mr. President. Uh, just a, a point of clarification on, on a comment about graduate tuition and, and what we control and what we don't. Um, we do have, it is true that we have some control, but there are limits on how much you can raise it in any given year. So it, uh, if, if people think that we've got the full uh, authority, it's my understanding anyway, that we we don't have the ability to, in one year to go out and let it float anywhere we want to, that there are limits to how much we can raise in any given year. Is, is that so right? It's, it's, it's sort of... Okay. Is, is that right? I, I, I think we ought to put it on the table and understand it. Yeah, there's a 10% there's a limit on how much you can raise yeah, in any given year. Yeah, I, I believe that that's is true 10, as well. Tim can give us that answer, though. That a 10, there is a 10% cap, and that's a statutory cap, assuming the legislature has control of tuition. Dr. Chase? Just as a point of information, the graduate student tuitions, we've priced ourselves out of the national market at this point. They're so high. We're really overcharging for graduate school tuition. And so you're not going to get all that many people coming from out of state to pay our rates. Um, because we've had it, 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 it's much higher than national. Well, I'm well, talking overall, yeah. well, not talking specific institutions, but I think it ought to be on the table, and I think it ought to be studied, <laughs> because if we've had an opportunity, I, we clearly have an opportunity here in law school. I, I, I don't care which school you're talking about. I, I've got to conclude with Governor Temple that it should be on the table, and I'd like to ask Tim or Nate if you guys could get back to us with a study with regard to where our graduate school tuition, particularly in those professional areas that Governor Temple was talking about, falls, we can talk about that at the next meeting. So we'll at least get some on just in direction for universities. We'd be happy to do that. It, it just the, the general outlines would be that uh, Governor Chase is correct that our out-of-state tuition um, is, is quite high. Our in-state tuition uh, is about average uh, at the graduate level. There's a trend in graduate programs to differentiating tuition um, among programs. We've seen some of that with some of the programs that have come online, like the uh, doctor of physical therapy that, that might have different tuition depending on the program costs and demand. Um, so the average figure might you know, not be as relevant as what you might be able to charge in some fields rather than others, depending on what a student might be able to afford with the credential that they're getting. Uh, so we'll come back with some of, some of that detail uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the next meeting. Oh, because this, this, this came up in my mind when we were looking at the medical schools. And on medicine, we're in the middle, maybe a little bit, bit above. So we were okay. And then I asked for some other schools, and I, and I got the other schools. I looked at dental, and we're okay there. But I looked at law school, and I grew up. So <laughs> anyway. So maybe, maybe that's an isolated case. I don't know, but I think we really need to. Well, Governor, I agree it should be on the table, and perhaps at our next meeting we can we can get that report back. Uh, Governor Roberts. Just for Governor Temple, the fact is we have some programs in this state that are great quality, the law schools being one that that there, I think it's appropriate to look at the number of our applicants in out of state, and, and I I am a market lady. I like to see what the market will bear on that. Great. Let me, let me draw us back to the motion on the floor, which is to direct each institution of the state university system to align its student enrollment with budget cuts, faculty reductions, and reduced state appropriations. Is there any discussion on that motion? No. Governor Edwards has called the question. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And okay. opposed. Next motion. 
that the Board, Board of Governors direct each institution to make necessary changes in, in its admission policies and procedures to anticipate the possibility of enrollment reduction for the 2008-2009 academic year. Is there a second, by Governor, and second by Governor Edwards? Any discussion on the motion? Yes. Uh, I think. It, sorry. I think it'd be appropriate to just uh, make a comment here before I vote. Um, I would like to note that you know this was a very tough decision for me, particularly as a student, and I know for everybody uh, involved because access is such a main priority for students and for this board. However, you know I'll be voting in favor of this, and that's because right now our main priority is the current students, and that is, uh, as we're seeing from a lot of data, um, facing some difficulties. So I believe for their success that um, I, I should be voting for this. However, I do want to note that you know what we can do, we should be doing on the form of that. Point well taken, and, and I know that the university presidents and the trustees are going to be very sensitive to that issue. Uh, and I, we're not hearing much from the presidents on this issue. I presume that these are realities that you all have been taking into account as you've been operating your universities over the time, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I think it is prudent for us to uh, to plan for the worst. I would also caution us, however, that uh, access is important. And as we make these changes to realign our enrollment patterns, that uh, they don't disproportionately affect those populations of students who historically have been underserved by higher education in this state. Absolutely. The, the, the commitment to diversity in our student body has is, is got to be essential as well. Sorry. Governor Parker. Uh, Mr. Chair, I guess that was um, my question because I'm, I, that, that this sounds good in theory, but what does that really look like? I mean, does that mean that if um, you just kind of look at some numbers and say based upon you know, the fact that you know, your grade, your SAT aren't quite as high as the person in front of you, you know, we cut you off? I guess I'm interested in practice. Um, I'm, I'm looking to the presidents or the representatives from the university. So let me know if, if, if we pass this, that in you know in action that looks like what? You know, yeah. Um, I can I can tell you that at least from our perspective, what that would um, mean is not a regression equation approach to admissions, which in a sense is that you, you put in class rank or SAT or whatever and come out with some magic number. Uh, but obviously moving toward a more active selection process for the kind of students that we would like to invite to attend the University of West Florida and would certainly enrich the educational experience of, of everyone, faculty, staff, students included. So I think what it would uh, mean a, uh, a much more serious look at enrollment management from a strategic perspective, not only for each institution but for the system, uh, but also some thinking uh, along the lines of who do, who uh, do we want to select rather than admit, and so I know I understand it's a subtle distinction, but nevertheless it's an important one, um, to bring in to enhance the, ac the, the academic and, and learning experience of everybody involved. President Evans. It's not in response to uh, Governor Parker's question, but I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about the historical enrollment pattern at Florida and m recently. While we are working to realign our enrollment, I'm not anticipating additional enrollment reductions. I mean, the enrollment at the institution has, has declined consistently uh, over the last three years. And so when you talk about each institution uh, to make those changes, uh, I think we need to look at what's going on at Florida and m in the direction of this motion, President Edmonds, is to ask you and your board to take a look based upon your existing funding levels, not certainly on a raw number, but based upon the funding levels uh, so that you can take a look and if your funding levels are sufficient, if you're funding your enrollment, you know, and that's why we're not trying to, as Governor Temple said, micromanage the process, but rather just ask the universities or direct the universities to comport their enrollment and their student population to and their faculty numbers and everything else to their funded budget levels. Any other questions or comments on the motion? Governor Pappas? I, I certainly see the need to, to address this issue and there are no easy solutions to it, but I have a question and that is 
we are, we have a two plus two system. We have a very active and valuable community college network. And I'm just asking for guidance in terms of as we limit our enrollment, that's going to increase the pressure on the community college system, I would presume. And how do we factor that? I mean, I guess part of us would say that's their problem in their budget, and I think that's part of the answer. But it obviously, I'm suggesting the ramifications go further than just us dealing with our particular issue here, and I'd like some guidance from you. Chancellor, I know we've had that conversation. Do you want to enlighten us? We at the recent board meeting made the commitment when we reduced our, when we asked our presidents to cap freshman enrollment growth at the funded level, that we would continue to maintain our doors open to two plus two transfers who were, of course, eligible. And it is our hope that we could continue to do that. However, we're going to have to have conversations with our presidents to make sure that we understand why that is still not possible. And in some instances, it may not be because they may be already over their funded levels at the upper division level. And essentially, what we, what is happening here is that the state university system is shrinking. And we do not have the ability to continue to keep our doors open in the context of the shrinkage. However, what we're asking our presidents to do, even though we're limiting our input, is to find a way to maintain our output. And that gets to the issue of disadvantaged groups or minority groups, because what counts is not only who gets in, but who gets out and when they get out. And in part, that's Governor Mosley's point about the commitment to the students who are in place. Our challenge right now, and you will hear me say a little bit later on, our graduation rates are stagnant. And our retention, first and second year retention rates are declining, in part because of absence of advisors, absence of availability of classes, absence of support that's necessary, whether it's financial support to continue, which does not augur well for our graduation rates over the next few years. So we are shrinking. And the end result is that we are, from a fiduciary perspective, taking responsibility to protect the currently enrolled students from that shrinkage as much as possible. So we're going to have a conversation with the presidents about trying to urge them to keep their doors open for eligible community college transfers. I cannot guarantee you that each of the cases will be able to do that. And we will have to go to Plan B. President Medeek. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make three comments. First, with respect to Governor Parker's question, no matter how careful, how thoughtful we are, there's no question in my mind that if we were to further, rather than just hold enrollment, reduce enrollment, our freshman profile would go up and would go up significantly. Right now, we have about 75 percent of our students are from minority groups that haven't had the access that other groups have had to higher education. And our incoming SAT for the fall is 250 to 300 points above the average of those minority groups. And our grade point average is already 3.6 average coming in. You take that any further, you are taking significant chunks out of the population. Last year, we turned down about 180 students between 1150 to 1200 SAT because we were basically full. So that's one point. Second point is with respect to out-of-state students, after 9-11, we suffered tremendously, as did, I think, most if not all of my colleagues. We will take all the out-of-state students. We're delighted to come. We don't pay any attention to the 10 percent cap. We're considerably away from that 10 percent cap. We suffered tremendously in international students because of visa and in out-of-state students that are national because of prices 
uh, are already at ceiling high level in most areas. Uh, with respect to the third point, which is uh, tuition in state for uh, graduate programs, I think each program has a very different characteristic and has a very different level of optimization. For instance, a medical school. We're just starting a medical school. We want to keep prices competitive so we'll have a large applicant pool for that class. The law school is doing extraordinarily well. Uh, you know, the top one or two in the state in bar passage exams, I think that in the law school we can consider having a higher in-state tuition, not a higher out-of-state because we do want at least a few people from out-of-state uh, to come you know, and be part of our law school. With respect to uh, doctoral students uh, that are trying to uh, uh, progress towards their uh, PhD, it, it is almost a self-inflicted wound to increase tuition anymore because most of those folks have fellowships. And if we give them fellowships, we increase tuition and we give them fellowships, we're just kidding ourselves. Uh, we will charge the few that don't have fellowships. So each one is, is like a little business, you know, in its own that requires its own individual optimization. Thank you, Mr. President. Governor Parker. You know, what's interesting to me is that um, as I understand the process, the, the university has an option to a, a accept or deny a student based upon whatever policies or standards that it right. accepts or, or that it establishes. So what you're telling me as an example is that, you know, we have this high SAT standard, high GPA, and that that's what's happening with our freshman class. But consider that based upon what the chancellor just said is that despite that, students still aren't graduating and we're still losing students somewhere between that sophomore junior year. So is it that we need to rethink our formula for what we should accept? Is it just that because you have a 3.6 or because you have, you know, different ACT or SAT scores that that should be the prevailing factor? I guess at a time okay. when, you know, we need to make sure that we're cutting back, but also that it seems that we're going to be systematically cutting out different minority populations, we also got to kind of broaden what we look at when we consider what makes a good student who gets out. Well, so I guess I want you to this, consider this all that. statistics on graduation rates are uh, one of the most fallacious set of statistics that I can think of. I'd like to hear from my colleagues. But for instance, uh, you get a number of students in our community, particularly women, okay, large Latin community, they say you can't leave until you're 20. They all want to leave, go somewhere else, okay? They want to go out of state, they want to go to the northern part of the state, they want to go to the central part of the state. So they do perfectly fine for us for two years. Then a number of them will go to UCF, go to Florida State, we go to the University of Florida. To say that we have failed those students in some way is totally you know, inappropriate. So when the voluntary system of accountability is implemented, assuming it is implemented, we start to track students so we get credit for if they graduated from somewhere, I think you'll see some very significant you know, numbers. Uh, our students typically do not, uh, you know, do not uh, opt out because of academic reasons. It's economic reasons or mobility uh, of the family or they wish to leave their family to be independent in another place. That's one. Number two, you will see that as we have become more selective in the past few years and stopped growing and maybe even now shrinking, you will see in four or five years increased graduation rates as a consequence of the increased uh, you know, selectivity. Um, I'd like to, to uh, second what President Medeek said and, and add that um, there's also a fair amount of evidence to indicate that particularly students, first-generation college students, the academic support structure that helps them complete um, is one of the things that, that gets looked at and disappears in budget cut scenarios in order to, to maintain the core academic mission of the institution. As the Chancellor pointed out, it's the uh, academic advisors and support structure that tends to, to get eliminated before um, faculty and, and so on just because of the way that, that these things work in, in reductions. So we have to also take a look at, when we talk about uh, faculty reductions in, in budget cuts, also the ramifications of staff reductions and where are those staff being reduced and what are the impact that that will have on the academic performance of the students. Thank you, Mr. President. Other comments or questions on the motion? Let me reiterate the motion is that the Board of Governors direct each institution to make necessary changes in its admissions policies and procedures to anticipate the possibility of enrollment reductions for the 08-09 academic year. Mr. Chair. Mr. President. 
Mr. Chair, let me offer an observation. It seems, and I appreciate the comments that have been made. I'm pleased and not at all surprised about the desire not to want to micromanage, and I think we all appreciate that. But it seems to me that with the motion that's on the floor directing us to change policies and procedures, it seems to me that if the desire is to have us realign our enrollments, our budget cuts, our faculty, et cetera, as stated in Bullet 1, I think giving us more degrees of freedom to do that, because I think some of us may be better able to do that without changing policies or procedures. Admissions policies and procedures have evolved over time, and they've evolved in the context of shared governance. Changing policies could be labor-intensive when we can have the impact that I think the Board is seeking without changing policies, at least some of us. I guess what I'm asking the Board to consider is to not just direct us to change policies and procedures to accomplish what's stated in Bullet 1, but state what's in Bullet 1 and let us determine how we get there. It says necessary. Thank you. President Hitt. I just wanted to point out that maybe there is none necessary. Secondly, sometimes it helps to state the obvious. Let me just say something I suspect is obvious to everyone. If you get a state budget cut, you know how much you're getting from the state. If you then reduce your enrollment, it may be a good thing to do, but it cuts your budget further, because those students who you eliminate would have paid tuition. Now, that's only 25 percent or less of the cost of their education, but it's money. And in a really tight situation, that's a loss of marginal revenue that could make your situation even worse in the short run. My question. Madam Chair. President Hitt, and I'm sure you can answer this, but if it costs you $100 to educate that student, and we're telling the state that it's costing more than $100, and the student's paying $25, how's that helping? Well, to the extent that you have to give notice to people whom you're going to lay off that may go a full year, you've got $25 to help you cushion that downturn while you're making the adjustments in labor force you have to make. But, Mr. Chairman, it's really worse than that, because if you fall out of the corridor, then it's not only the tuition you lose, you lose enrollment money. Chancellor, could you go over that? I think it's important. You know, as a naive member of industry, I came here, and I didn't realize, you know, that, you know, that was the case. If you could, could you clarify that, the corridor and that kind of stuff? Basically, not only do you lose, if you had it, the state support, you lose the revenue, tuition that you've collected, and you not only lose that from your operating budget, your student fee collections decline. There's a set of, if you will, spread effects that will result in a further shrinkage of the budget. So that's why I use the word shrinkage, because in essence, it becomes a downward spiral. However, the challenge that we have is that we've always been so willing to accept students without the necessary revenue, that that's really why we are in the position, in some respects, that we are today. And what I'm looking for, and I think that I have agreement with the President, is that at some point we've got to get the enrollment growth logic figured out once and for all, and that we ask our universities to stay on their enrollment growth targets and not to expect, should for some reason enrollment growth to exceed the funded target, that either the board or the legislature would be able to pay for it at some point down the road. So in some respects, it's a very painful adjustment process that we're going through, as Dr. Hitt and Dr. Magee have pointed out. Governor Pappas. This may speak more to the first motion than the second, but I'm assuming implicit in this is addressing which programs are going to experience the effects of people's limitation on it. In other words, we have the strategic plan, we have these objectives for targeted degrees, and so if we're not aligning these enrollment issues with those objectives at the same time, we can turn our strategic plan on its head by 
misaligning the enrollment with output expectations. I think that's, in fact, if I may, why we're trying to give our local boards and our presidents maximum flexibility in this. But, of course, you did approve in forward by design focusing and focusing around priorities. And so this is, again, this will begin that process. And I think some presidents, I know President Genshaw is actually having that conversation as we speak. Governor Dostler. The first motion that we approved has the word in it, direct, that the Board of Governors is directing each institution. Do we need that word? In other words, I get a sense that we're giving each institution the flexibility to deal with these financial problems that they face. And I'm not so sure when we say direct, we're not saying more than we meant to say. And that's the only question I have. Well, we certainly have that in the first and in the second. And perhaps that's the one that's creating trouble in the second motion. And as we continue the conversation, I guess one thing we need to wonder is whether or not the contents of the second motion is subsumed in the first motion by itself. Governor Edwards and then Governor Martin. I kind of think we're really completely overreacting to these words. What I think we're trying to say is that our enrollment projections, our faculty, et cetera, have got to be in line with the funds that we have. We're not telling each university how to do this. And I think we're really arguing over a lot of nothing. The intention is clear. I would leave them as they are. I just want to say one thing. In dealing with the legislature for a number of years, they have directed us to drop the request for unfunded enrollment. Leave it behind. It's hard for us to do that because we recognize they are unfunded. But our universities have accepted these in hopes that they will be funded in arrears. And I'm not sure that's been – in this time it has not been policy. But many of our universities have – that's what they've done. And now they're dragging this unfunded group of people. And while it may bring revenue in, at some point it catches up with you. So it is – it's complicated and difficult. But I believe we're – I'm trying to support the legislature in what they've directed us to do for many years. Governor Martin and Governor Parker. I think these are indeed troubled times that we're facing. And I'm wondering just here in the comments around the table, Governor Temple talking about the past 18 months looking at what's been happening in the real estate market. I think we have to realize that, you know, there is a need for a reality check here. You know, the funds are not going to be coming in. So what impact will it have on the universities? If we approve, which we have approved, the first motion, is there really a need for two and three? One seems to be, in my mind, all-encompassing and not wanting to micromanage, you know, the universities. But if we were to only deal with the first one and allow them to come back and do what they probably have already started to do, I'm sure they have not just been sitting back just waiting for us to give them additional direction in terms of what they need to do. So are we overreacting? You know, could we just deal with the first item and let them respond? Chancellor, would you like to comment? It may appear that it's duplicative. However, what we're trying to reinforce is that it's not really an option, that it needs to be done. And that will avoid the likelihood of the perception that some institutions are doing it and others aren't, number one. Number two, this is, this second part is, addresses the challenges that our presidents have now on admissions. Because they are in the process of admitting students. And the reality is that we do not want our students to be admitted unless there's a seat for them. 
and there may be necessary for some institutions to create waiting lists, which might not be a normal policy under a more robust, aggressive, access-oriented admission approach. And so it's an invitation to our institutions to begin to find alternative ways to deal with standard approaches, particularly as it relates to admissions. Governor Parker. I guess my comment in, in response to that is that I think that um, that we can accomplish. I, I understand what the chancellor is saying is that because that's been such a thorny issue with the, you know, is there a need to specifically address enrollment? Um, and my concern is that that there's still a possibility of the negative consequences of of, of this type of a, of a direction. And I think that the issue is handled with number one and number three and that I don't think that number two is necessary, and so I'd ask that we not enact number two. Go ahead and make it. If, if, if I were doing a job in a corporation, which is what I used to do, what you would really do is number one, number three, and then you would have an, a third one that says, and uh, the, you, each institution shall take the necessary action that uh, will provide maximum flexibility in their enrollment procedures in order to carry out the above or something along those lines. Okay. Governor Gosper. I, I agree with that suggestion. That solves my concern with the word direct, um, and it uh, eliminates this issue with item two. Uh, I would, I would uh, uh, accept uh, that. There is a motion and a second on the floor approving the second motion. What I'd like to do is call the question on that dispatch with that motion and then come back, Governor McDivitt, with an amendment because it seems yeah. as though we, well, can we have could. I would be glad to make that as a, as a substitute motion that would have us approve uh, number three and a new number yeah. as, as number two and a new number three, if you'd like. We can certainly do that, Governor Temple. That's fine with me. No objection. Uh, we haven't proposed number three, but uh, I'll propose number three with the modifications you suggest. I mean, it's, it's just words to me, but that's fine with me. Well, okay, G Governor McDivitt, if you would I, Governor McDivitt, if you would restate your proposed substitute motion on two, and I presume it will encompass the language of three, and perhaps we can dispatch it. Go ahead and propose. Restate your substitute okay, motion. Okay, um, I would. I would. Uh, my substitute motion is I move that we adopt bullet three as number as bullet two and eliminate bullet two and add a new bullet three that would say and uh, that that each institution uh, is authorized to make the necessary changes to provide the optimum flexibility to uh, deal with uh, potential enrollment reductions going forward or something along those lines. Then they can do it any way they choose to do it, whether they amend their, their uh, regulations and, or, or policies and procedures, or maybe they don't need to do that. Well, is there a well, second on the substitute motion? I second. Make the, make the necessary change. Okay, to, all right. To make the necessary there are admission policies and procedures. Well, that's I second that motion. That. We have a substitute motion and a second, and I promise that at the full board meeting we'll have clear language to distribute to everyone I'll on what, what this is. Is there any further discussion on the substitute motion? Seeing that, I'll call the question. All in favor of the substituting of the motion or amending the prior motion, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Now on the main motion. Governor Temple. Yeah, one, one more uh, item did talk about tuition assessment. Well, if it's not on this, can I just can I finish the vote on this last one? Oh, motion? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the first vote was just to substitute the motion. Yeah, okay. Is there any further discussion on the motion in the whole? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed, Governor Temple. Uh, when I looked at the graduate school tuition, um, I, I guess one of the things I'm going to be looking at in the future is, uh, and those take law school because I focused on that. But, but as I remember. When I looked at in-state tuition on, on 
some of the medical programs, we were not only you know competitive with other in-state tuitions, but we were competitive uh, with out charging out-of-state students. But when I looked at law schools, as I recall, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they're back in my office. Uh, what I'm going to look for is, I think some of our law schools, I wouldn't say all of them, were pretty far up there in charging out-of-state students, but we're way down at the bottom <laughs> on the in-state. So I want to, you know, if, if we've got a good enough law school to be way up there for an out-of-state student, we should be in the same place for in-state students. So that's kind of my test. Thank you, Governor. Governor Chase? Um, if I could uh, get a sense on the timeline for the chancellor to um, yeah, what present the amendment enrollment plan. Presidents, what is a reasonable time for you to... I didn't say the president, it says the chancellor. He's got to get it from them. Yeah, there should be a timeline on that. Yeah. Chancellor, do you have a goal in mind? In terms of the when, when I would report to you? Yes, sir. March meeting. March. President, does that give your trustees time to dispatch this question? It's the end of March. <laughs> and remember that the emissions are usually done by April 1. Um, so we're not going to be the impact. I'm going to take silence as tacit consent. Uh, I want to be tacit. Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, Mr. President. Okay. Again, I'll take it as a consent. Then to a March date for the Chancellor to yes, report back to us. Mr. Chair, our uh, Florida Gulf Coast University, our next uh, Council of Trustees meeting is April. Is there anything about uh, that? Uh, yeah, I think we can. I mean, uh, certainly the possibility of a special session if the Chair is so inclined, and I would be willing to, of course, to explore that if, uh, if need be. Right. Thanks, Mr. President. Governor Edwards. Mr. Chairman, I'm not uh, happy with the motion that I'm going to make, but I think it needs to be made. I would uh, like the staff, if they could, to pass out uh, what I'm going to propose. We have heard today uh, that we're currently ranked 50th in the state in average four-year tuition for a public university. Faculty ratio is the worst among all the 50 states. We rank 42nd in financial aid. A part of this ingredient, if we're going to recover from where we are now to where we want to be, whether you like it or not, we've got to be raising our tuition. And I'm not talking about raising tuition even to the national average. I would like to move that we increase resident undergraduate tuition in equal increments over the next five years sufficient to reach the top of the fourth quartile of the 50 states and use the revenues to hire and retain faculty with 30% of the increased revenue dedicated to need-based financial aid for elders. There's a motion from Governor Edwards. Is there a second? Could, could you read that again? Uh, it should, should be passed oh, out. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it. I'll be happy to read it again, though, for those who haven't gotten a copy. It says, to increase residents' undergraduate tuition in equal increments over the next five years, sufficient to reach the top of the fourth quartile of the 50 states, and use the revenues to hire and retain faculty, with 30% of the increased revenue dedicated to need-based financial aid for eligible students. Is there a second to the motion? There is a second. It was Governor Parker. And discussion on the motion, President Madik. You just had, I just had a question. Um, uh, Governor Edwards, I presume this would be the same as saying at the top of the bottom quartile. Is that correct? At the top of the bottom quartile. Just because yes, I, I, I wouldn't want, which is going to, 
improvement in terms of uh, persuading people that we can do this. Because if you say the top quartile, but this is the bottom. Yes. This the is top correct. of the bottom. This is the top of the This puts us at about Mississippi as far as yeah. tuition. Right. 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 And well, Chairman Perez, isn't that, I, I support, and I support the motion and thank you for it, but I want us all to understand that we have the greatest state in the country. The greatest state in the country, my personal opinion. And this is how we're setting our country. We have the greatest state in the country, and we are setting our standards this low. But I support the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I, I, Let, let's just start with yeah. Governor Chase and work around. I know my, only concern, my only concern with this, and I, I like the idea, but I want to make sure that the legislature just doesn't cut our budgets every time we raise tuition by that mouse. So I, I, I know of no way to assure that. Uh, exactly. And so when you argue that it's going to be used to hire and retain faculty, what will happen then when you run into a contradiction in terms of you've now got your general revenue budget cut and you've now said, well, you can hire faculty, but you can't use it to run the university. Can I answer him? I, I have a lot of conversations with legislators, and all of them I meet are people of goodwill. And I have confidence and hope that that would not happen. And, and budgets are public. We all see them. The press sees them. Students see them. And I have confidence that they want what is best for these students who are trying to get to a system and make a better life for themselves and for our state. Governor Mosley. Okay, so uh, obviously I think we're all kind of reacting to this. And my, my initial reactions, and I think the reactions that I've had consistently over the course of the year, have been that we definitely need to address the tuition program. I think there's no question. My concern with the wording on this is two problems. Number one, uh, once again, it kind of goes back to when we talked uh, with the strategic plan and the uh, board by design, is I'm not a huge fan of aiming at a particular dollar value to aim at a particular dollar value. Um, I'm very interested, and this is the second problem, to aim at particular results. And once again, the derivative of that will be a tuition increase by a percentage thereof. The, the, the part in there too is we've got to make sure that everybody's invested in those results that we are trying to obtain. So the, the university presidents, the students, the faculty, you know, members of the Board of Governors, they all believe in the final results, whether or not it's the uh, you know, to use higher retained faculty and 30 cents the number that you want to use. But I don't think we should be just throwing out a dollar value to throw out a dollar value. I think our motion should be we want to attain these results, these are the results that we believe in, these are the results that we have input in, and a derivative of that, once again, will be a dollar value change to tuition. That's my concerns and that's my concern. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin, any comments? You know, we do have a serious problem. We must address that. Whether, the, whether this formula is the right formula, but, uh, that I don't know, but I certainly support it. Thank you, Governor. Governor Edwards, anything else to add there? Governor Pappas, any? I guess I'm, I'm questioning why we're going beyond the motion to increase the tuition and dealing with the faculty statement and the, and the need base. Is that to make it more palatable? Well, I think to some extent the answer is yes. Yes. I mean, we do, do live in a political society whether we wish to acknowledge it in higher education or not. And it also deals specifically then with the fact that, you know, our faculty ranking per student is the worst in the country. Our, our financial aid is extremely poor. And we have always said at least in the times that I've been involved, with tuition increases that we're not trying to penalize the student who doesn't have the financial resources. And I think it is extremely important. We've used the 30% figure a number of times. But the governor has used the 30% figure. I know he is comfortable with that figure. Uh, 
and I think it does make you know, when we talked about differential tuition as an example, uh, when the University of Florida came forth initially saying, here's what we want and here's what we're going to do with it. When, when people say specifically, here's what we're going to do with it, I think it is much easier to approve the concept than it is if it's blanket going to raise tuition 20% a year that goes to the university to do with as they please. And I think also I would applaud the student leadership that we have had uh, for the last several years. Uh, they are being very realistic in this, but they have always insisted that as a, as a, a portion, part of this increase, that financial aid be increased and that the faculty ratios be addressed because that directly affects the quality of the education you're having today. So that's why this specifically addresses those two things. Governor Dustford? I, I uh, share the sentiments behind this motion, and, and I think all of us uh, have these concerns, the same concerns that you have, uh, uh, Governor Edwards. I'm very concerned about anything for five years. Uh, I don't know what other universities and other, what's going to take place in other states over the next five years. Uh, this number, the Chancellor tells me, is about 13% a year. If that's correct, uh, that's the headline. I'm not so sure that if I were in the legislature, I'd be very comfortable with the Board of Governors suggesting that we're going to have a 13% a year increase. And I'm not sure whether that's enough or not enough four years out. So, so while I uh, share the sentiments behind this and the frustration behind the statistics that we are all uh, seeing here today, and experiencing in our system, uh, I nevertheless would not favor this motion uh, simply because I think we ought to at least at the moment deal with this on a year-by-year -year basis. Uh, so I'm, I'm very troubled by this and could not support it. Madam Chair? Um, just a couple of comments. I mean, I too worry about the length of the uh, the five-year aspect to this because, you know, we could have a few good years and remedy a lot of these issues and not have to, um, you know, go, go whatever the percentage increase is on an annual basis. Also, I worry about targeting our, our uh, sites so low. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to think that what we really want to do is to be at the top of the bottom but uh, I understand the realities of it. I do think that it's necessary um, to uh, be able to say if we're going to raise any tuition that a certain percentage, percentage of it needs to go to financial aid. But I also think that we need to tackle this problem in a much more comprehensive way. And I've been saying that now for several years. And now is not the time to go into it. I, I will be perfectly honest. I'm going to wait till I hear from all my colleagues before I decide how I feel about this motion because it is um, a difficult situation at this point in time. Governor Parker. What's interesting is that um, part of what Governor Dashburg doesn't like about the motion, I, I sort of like. I like the idea that because we're dealing with percentages and, um, and kind of comparing ourselves to the uh, other, or to other states in the country, and it suggests that it is somewhat of a moving target and can change based upon what's happening within the, you know, within the scheme of things. So I, I think that's a good thing, particularly if we're going to focus on a five-year period. Um, you know, it is uh, concerning that, uh, you know, that we're talking about, you know, shocking the system almost, but it seems like it may be necessary at this point. But my, my real question at this point is, what does that really mean numbers-wise? You know, I'm the person that always asks, Okay, so that, that breaks down to this much per quarter, per semester more, per student. So can somebody respond to that question? Dollars. How much? $440, I believe, the first year in terms of actual dollars. Nate, so $440. So $440 extra per semester or per year? Nate, do you have those numbers? Um, 
We're about 46 percent behind Mississippi and Arizona right now, which is where that benchmark is aiming. To get there over four years or five years, we'd have to increase it 8 percent a year. And then based on historical trends, you'd have to add about 5 percent to figure where the bottom quartile is going to be per year, five years from now. So that's about 13 percent, which would be about $440 the first year. It would obviously be a little more the next year if you're talking in percentage terms. So now you say $220 per semester then? Yes, roughly. Okay, so it's $220 more per student per semester is what we're talking about per year. That's right. And to put this in perspective, the national average tuition is about $6,200 right now. And what sounds like a big percentage to us generates relatively few dollars. If we were at the national average, it would only take a 6 percent tuition increase to generate $400 a year. Because we're the bottom in the country, it sounds like a big percentage, but it's about the average tuition increase last year was about 6 percent or about $400 nationwide. So from that perspective, it's not a whole lot. So I just heard you say then that this 13 percent is that 13 percent for us is basically about the same as the rest of the country experience, but it was a lower percentage because they were much further ahead. Right. A 13 percent increase for us is, in dollar terms, the national average tuition increase last year. Let me ask an obvious question. For those students who are on Bright Future, then this would come out of Bright Future pockets or would it come from someplace else? Well, one of the initiatives under Board by Design is to look at the balance of financial aid and work to have more of the state's aid and need-based aid and not have Bright Futures necessarily be the main focus for financial aid in the state. So that would be a legislative decision, obviously. It's a legislative program. But as far as this Board's prerogative, tuition would be your decision and financial aid would, I think, be the legislature's decision. So what I also think what I heard you say is that as things stand right now, if we agree to this particular motion, then those students who are on Bright Futures, then it would just be paid from Bright Futures as things stand right this moment. It would be a legislative decision whether to cover it or not. The way the law is currently written, it would be, but every year, you know, they have to look at their budget and decide what they can afford. Have they made any recent changes to Bright Futures that we can even think that they would make a change to that at this point? They have, actually. They were already decoupled in the sense that they are not covering the tuition differential program. And they also reduced, because of the budget shortfall, they reduced the stipend that the top scholars received this year. So they do and can make adjustments based on projected budgets. Thank you. Governor Pappas, did you need to respond to Governor Parker? And then I'll, okay. Okay, we'll come back around for that. Governor Duncan? The differential was one question that I had as far as when we're talking percentages. And I just want to make sure we're thinking through all of the consequences of this action and a percentage on a different, on a percentage. And also, I do share Governor Dashford's concern on the future years and that maybe as much for the reason that we're now tying our actions to the actions of others. And if they raise theirs significantly, you know, are we really saying that's still what we need to do to stay competitive? Or is, you know, are we trying to achieve a number or, you know, is there something we need to run the institutions the way that we need to go? And I guess, could you help me with the differential so that if, you know, you take the ads of our cumulative decisions here, what the impact could be to the student? You're asking me to address that. The differential, as it's currently in place, I believe has a total cap on the amount that universities can go up, which includes whatever the base increase is, plus the differential amount. Is that correct, Chancellor, in your understanding? So, okay. So, 
the way it's currently established by the legislature, um, that cap would be in effect and would include whatever the base increase uh, is in tuition. Uh, however, uh, as the board works on developing its own tuition policy, which might include differential, it would be your prerogative to establish how you would like that differential to work uh, with whatever the base increase is. And if we're talking about a statewide average, it does not necessarily have to be the same amount uh, at every institution. Uh, it could be, you know, less at one and more at another. Uh, however, this would establish a, a, a predictable uh, assumption for going forward, an assumption that, as several of you have pointed out, might have to be revisited, but at least, uh, at least an assumption to use in, in planning for the future. Senate Governor Lincoln. Governor Temple. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, I don't understand this. Uh, is what you're asking for here uh, uh, over the next uh, five years to, to then use 70% of those increased revenues to hire and retain faculty? Governor Temple, I, I, can't, I can't hear you. Can you get closer to the mic? Is what you're proposing to say that we're going to use 70% of those increased revenues from tuition to hire more faculty, and then the balance of the 30% for student aid? Is that is that what this motion is? I believe that 30% will be student aid. Uh, we certainly, uh, the majority of this should go to faculty. Could you Are bring that? I can't hear. I can't hear that. Can't hear you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. The, it does specifically require that 30% uh, go to need-based financial aid. It certainly suggests that the balance should go to hire and fire faculty. I retain faculty. Uh, it doesn't percentage-wise say that. Now, does that mean that this board couldn't change the allocation in the future? We can do anything we would like to do. Uh, but certainly, it is, it is is addressed primarily at the ranking that we have the worst student faculty ratio in the country. Okay. Now, and I, under, things, I understand that, but yeah. it's, it's just unclear to me. Okay, uh, uh, I'm just asking that to clarify. I try to clarify that from a system perspective. Our system loses, on average, 700 faculty a year on a base of about 10,000. We lose them through retirement, through competitive hires, through moving to research labs that are recently relocated in the state. We lose them. I, I understand uh, all that. I understand all so that. So the number, I'm trying to get at the number. The number that we think to start recovery and get back to a student-faculty ratio that is defensible for a state with our aspirations is 2,000 incremental faculty over the base. And this is consistent with the board's direction to us at Forward by Design, which was to move to some national averages. So our sense is we need to hire 2,000 incremental faculty over the next uh, five years to get back to that. So the, that's why we are indicating that 70% could be used to hire faculty or to retain faculty because, of course, the problem is if we could slow down the defection, we don't have to hire as many. And that we'd have to leave to each president. Uh, I, I hope that was helpful. But those well, no, are the numbers. No, I, I just want to be clear of what we're doing here. And it's not clear to me. I, I understand that you're trying to, to spend at least 30% of those increased funds to increase uh, need-based financial aid. I, that I understand. Yes. But I, but when you just say faculty, if you're gonna if you want to put in there 70% of that money, then then my next question is going to be to hire faculty. And my next question is going to be taking that out five years. Where does that put us in terms of student-faculty ratios? I mean, I intelligently vote on something like this, I think we should know those kinds of answers. It would put us at about average, about 25, 1 to 20, 25 to 1 is where it would put us. 
So we would have to hire, assuming that we could replace the 700 annually, we would still have to hire an incremental 2,000, which would be about 400 a year, in addition to maintaining, filling the 700 lines we're losing in order to get back to the average nationally. About 1 to 20, 25 to 1. Okay. Is that, is, now, is that, is that? That answers my question, although that's your estimate, but that answers my question. But the motion still doesn't, are you going to change it to say 70 percent? I would be happy to put 70 percent in there. So it's clear. And then, two, how long does it take us to get to average, not the top quartile? How long, if we raise tuition like this, when do we get, two years, two and a half years? I can't, can't answer that, but it's a long, well, it would depend on how much you want to increase it, obviously. But at a 10 percent increase rate, it would take us, I would guess, 15 years. I don't know. Nate, can you provide guidance there? At the, at the, going at the same rate as this proposed, we'd have to go on about another three years, three or four years, depending on what happens to the national average. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Hey, look, look, and I'm all in favor of doing something drastic. I think we need to do something drastic. I don't know. But what if this does, what if we have problems with this? Can we raise it, we pass this, and we raise it, you know, subject to the lawsuits and all the other things. And we decide this isn't working, we're not, we're not getting the students we want. I assume that this board can just revisit this issue. There's no, this is a new zone, right? It is designed, again, to, to talk about predictability of revenue sources. The purpose of laying out the five-year plan was to give us some predictability as to what might be available here. Obviously, it could change substantially if the state legislature should suddenly decide to, to increase our funding substantially. We will, might decide to have no tuition increase or even reduce it. It'll certainly bring bright futures to the table. Pardon? It'll certainly bring bright futures to the table. Correct. And that's one thing that I think everybody needs to understand up front on any of our tuition questions. Historically, state university systems have been great by two ways. One, having high tuition and low state support, or two, by having high state support and low tuition. Unfortunately, we have low state support and low tuition. It's very difficult to reach even a middle level at that point. So what this is designed to do is to put some predictability into it. Obviously, this board can change it at any time. It has been suggested, and I would certainly agree, and will modify the motion on the second line of the 50 states and use 70 percent of the revenues to hire and retain faculty with 30 percent of the increased revenue dedicated to financial aid. And also, after it says to hire and retain faculty, add the language including related administrative and support costs, which I meant to have in there, but certainly we would put that in there. Chairman, I would suggest that as I would amend my main motion. I don't remember who seconded it. I don't remember who seconded it. I will presume that that's an acceptable amendment. So it's now 70-30 and including related administrative and support costs. Governor Stavros, any thoughts? Gus, any thoughts? You want my comments? Yes, sir, if you care to share them. I want to commend the Board of Governors who have been listening to this story for five years and the President. I cannot understand. We all know we have a difficult situation. We all know when you say that we are 50th in four-year tuition and fees, that we rank the worst among the 50 states in faculty-student ratio, 42nd in financial aid. I've only been on this board one year. I'm embarrassed. 
I'm embarrassed. I have never been involved with a mediocre organization in my life. And this state university system, everybody says it. You get the czar in an interview with the Tampa Tribune saying, we have to fund these schools. This is Dean Colson at a level to allow them to provide adequate teacher-to-student ratios. We have to fund these education institutions where they can afford to pay salaries to attract the best faculty. We have to fund these institutions with an ability to produce baccalaureate degrees, not just in six years, but in a four-year period. Everybody knows the problems. We get down to tuition, and, and we get down to, uh, certainly to, uh, fund uh, the young people who want to go have need, we need, we need to have, and this is correct in financial aid, we have to give financial aid. Anybody who wants to go to college, we should fund it. You know, when, I, when I'm told by one of the presidents that, that he sees in the paper that uh, uh, one of the uh, students uh, who were tops in the class decided to go to a community college, and couldn't afford to go to his university. But he called and he made sure that he had enough funds for that student to go there because he wanted that student. I, I just, uh, to me, the constant here is that we need to raise tuition and that we're afraid of the legislature. I, I admire our legislators. They have a tough job. They, their time is not their own. They're constantly asked to do things. We have a problem. We have a problem in the state with funding. I don't understand why we don't raise tuition. And I mean, you know, I, I, I teach teachers about four or five times a year, and I tell them about what a great country we have, and that this country was not made great by mediocre people, but by outstanding people. Well, if we want to have quality education here to have our students be outstanding in the world of the future, the global world, we have to have quality faculty, professors. We have to raise tuition. And I'm, you know, I just am baffled here. I, I said, am I listening to all these comments here? Am I listening in a foreign language? If it's Greek, I can understand Greek, so it's not in Greek. <laughs> but let me just say that we all know it has to be done. And I know we say, oh, the legislature can cut our funds. I don't believe that they would hurt the system more than it's been hurt already. I, most of you around this table, all this, you, you are involved in education. You have given uh, of your own time, your talent, your treasury. There are students going to USF, FSU, Eckerd College under scholarships from my family because I believe in helping students. But we have to raise the tuition so that the universities can put their programs and have quality education. I am I'm so concerned that. You know, I had the, I mentioned I had the opportunity to go to a good university also, a great university, Columbia. And in 1940, when I went there in 42, last century, uh, it cost me less than $1,000 a year to go there. And I had $800 of that in a scholarship. Today, that university is $50,000 a year. The cost of these universities today is tremendous. We expect, if you run a business, as John has mentioned before, as a business person, if you run an organization that's losing, you shut it down. We don't want to have losing <coughs> universities. We need to get the best quali quality teachers and faculty and professors, and we've got to give, give all types of scholarships. So I. I mean, I'm sitting here, and I'm not on this committee, but I can just tell you that uh, that even after one year, I'm tired of hearing about we need to raise tuition. It's 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 wrong. Let's do it. And if the, if you know, I'm told that one I I uh, I'm meeting with one of the senators uh, next week. Uh,
senator that I have great admiration for. He's very much involved in career education. And I'm told he hates the Board of Governors because we joined the lawsuit. Well, I'm going to talk to him and say, don't hate us. <coughs> the Board of Governors, the presidents of the universities are dedicated with a great passion to do the right thing for the students of Florida. And that's what we're here for. So uh, I've been quiet, and I'm sorry to get on this bandwagon, Mr. Chairman, uh, but I just want to tell you that it's time that we do something about raising tuition and bite the bullet. I'm sorry, I've said that. Yeah. Thank you, Governor. Governor Martin. The two metrics that we have been discussing here this morning, now into the afternoon, that we rank 50th in terms of the fees per student, and we rank 50th in terms of the student-teacher ratio. And we had earlier discussion that maybe in California, uh, that figure that is shown on the slide there may not be appropriate for, for the two different systems. If you look at the California state system, that may show a different number versus uh, the University of California system. So I'm just kind of curious if there were other metrics that that exist that would show us in a different light. Do we always rank 50th and just what those metrics would be? I would be curious to you know, get some input from the <coughs> president in terms of what else is out there for us also to, to benchmark. How do we rank in other categories other than the two that we have discussed here uh, this morning? Um, I guess my concern is that we are going to the top of the fourth quartile. Are we setting our sights too low? Should it be higher? Should it be at least what the national average is? Or maybe the top of the third quartile? I think we need to shoot a little bit higher and not just be at the top of the fourth. Uh, the five year. Uh, Proposition. I have a concern about that. I think that we need to just address the issue and fund education, higher education, on an annual basis, whatever the market will dictate. What is a competitive fee structure for students attending universities? We should set whatever that is and have it as a competitive rate. It will increase to a certain level. If we're competitive, Florida is a growing state, which it was until recently. So are we setting our sights too low? Or should we identify something that's a little more equitable and not just tied to five years, but just address the issue? And I think the uh, adjustment that was made to the line that reads to hire retained faculty. I think on the differential discussion, we were talking about uh, counselors and faculty. So I'd like to see counselors added because if you add faculty, you also need to have the counselors to make sure the students aren't getting the counseling that they need to try to uh, increase the graduation rates. So I would say that overall, you know, we need to do something. The time is now uh, with some additional adjustments to the uh, recommendations I could probably support it. Thank you, Governor. Chancellor, do you want to answer a few of the questions that uh, Governor Martin posed? We are absolutely setting our sights too low. However, we will have another discussion at which we will share with you the appropriate and predictable funding options that we have worked out because the board did identify appropriate and predictable funding and we have a, a very useful chart to show you what appropriate and predictable could look like. Uh, however, the, uh, on, the, on an interim basis, we believe that it's important to have this discussion and to put further body to the agreement from the last Forward by Design meeting uh, related to tuition. The truth is, is that 
this does not stop the legislature from raising our base funding. And I believe Governor Edwards pointed out that, that raising our base funding could begin to reduce the necessity to try to get out of the bottom because that base funding increase would help us get out of the bottom. But in the short run, that's why we put on top recovery initiative. This is about recovery to the bottom in many ways. It's not about <laughs> going to the top. Thanks, Chancellor. We, we are way over time and we have a lot of agenda left. So I want to, just on this committee, we show another committee before lunch. So what I'd like to do is go back around one more time because I know there's some final thoughts, but if we've said it or heard it, let's not necessarily feel as though we have to reiterate it. Governor Chase. Right. I'd just like to answer one of uh, Governor Martin's questions, which would be the language that is in here currently about the related administrative support costs would support counselors look under that language. Um, I'm in support of this motion. I think anything that does that goes, uh, that comes into this group that will help faculty and the need-based financial aid to support students, because I believe that uh, I went through university with a lot of need-based financial aid, and I see nothing wrong uh, with investing in your future, and I think it's wise of us to think about investing in our faculty. So I support that. Thanks, Governor. Governor Mosley, or would you like to be the last speaker in the group as a courtesy? Um, so do you want to wait till everybody else goes and, and wrap for us as the students? Let's, let's let you finish it for us. Um, I think I've actually got a good point to this. Well, Go ahead, then. Um, when, when I've been listening to a lot of the conversations, um, I've actually got even more concern, I would say. And I think one of the best points that was brought up was uh, Governor Parker's about photograph teachers and prepaid. And uh, what, what concerns me about the motion is that, once again, I like the fact that we created a strategic document. I like the fact that we spent our time in making that. And whether or not we are under realizing it, I think there's the potential where we're making a big picture decision here. And I think that big picture decision is because of the margin of increase that we could be making a decision today to potentially decouple tuition and bright futures and prepaid. And for a student, that is a huge precedent and concern for us. And it's something that we would like, um, and, and it's a major concern to be honest with the motion in general, more time to address more time to get information on. You know, like everybody on this board, we received this information or this draft of a motion 45 minutes ago. So um, obviously that's a concern. We would like to know if Bright Futures and Prepaid have had these conversations, if whether or not they are able to cover these increases, how the conversations with legislatures, uh, the legislature has gone on those issues. And also like to hear from the presidents. You know, we're talking about setting priorities here uh, with 30% need-based aid, and students have identified that as a priority before. But we would like to know with the five-year timeline that we're talking about right now, you know, would presidents like more flexibility on that issue? Is that something that maybe we should define over the course of five years? Is the time issue a concern? Is the priorities a concern? Are we going to improve in certain areas with differential tuition? For certain universities, would they like other additional things? And I think that basically we are making this motion has just quickly come up and we're making a lot of big picture decisions. And because we're making those type of decisions, it would be my urge not to vote for this in consideration of the factors that we, we might not have shot this around as much as we should have for such a big decision. Thank you. Thanks, Governor. I mean, yeah, Governor Secretary? Thanks. Governor Edwards? I've, I've said uh, more than I should say already, but simply in response to the big to the decision question, uh, bright futures, I would certainly hope that we affect that, right? I, the 30% need-based is in there. I have contended for a long time, and I think others on this board would agree that bright futures should be need-based related in some sort. Uh, what's happening today is, is people uh, who, who could well afford to send their children to college are getting the same amount as that family that just plain and simply can't afford it. And I don't think that's right. I never have thought it's right. And if this would help change that, I'd be even more for it than I already am. But of course, I'm already for it. So I'll say more than enough. I'll shut up. And just a 
quick reply, just so everybody's aware in the room. We are on the same page. Students are on the same page. The Florida Student Association over the course of the last two months, including our next meeting, we actually had workshops based on Florida Bright Futures in advance. We do believe that that system needs to change, and we were actually hoping to be the go-ahead people and come out in front on that issue. But once again, we see the problem there. We notice that, but we want to make sure that we're doing it in the right way. And we believe the right way is not necessarily making this call and saying adjust to it, but really say what do we want out of our Bright Futures? How should we reshape that reform? And then go ahead and push that from the students and hopefully with the Board of Governors. Thank you. Governor Pappas, any additional thoughts? Well, we'd probably beat it to death, but I frankly would find it more palatable if it were a motion to raise tuition for the ensuing year, given the circumstances that we find ourselves in from a budgetary standpoint, as opposed to saying we're doing something for five years that we're going to back up and revisit every year. So I gather that that's not a friendly motion or a friendly amendment that you may or may not accept, but it's just my thinking. Governor Nusker? My recollection is there was a McKinsey study done a few years ago. One of the comparisons was the general revenue component in the state of Florida compared to other states as to funding FTEs. We rank quite high, meaning the state of Florida on that scale was very generous. I can't recall where we ranked at the time, and I don't know where we would rank today, but the point I'm trying to make when we make a decision like this is I understand, and I'll assume we can't impugn, we probably wouldn't be able to impugn the faculty, student-faculty ratio. Twenty-five percent of our funding comes from tuition. Is that about right? Let's just use that number. Twenty-five percent of our funding comes from tuition. So if we rank favorably against the other states with regard to general revenue, then it really means that tuition is driving this. And I would say maybe we need to think about that a little more before we go raising tuition 13 percent a year for five years. And again, I'm very troubled by taking a five-year action, and I don't see a slide on general revenue compared to other states up here. I don't know what other things we should be looking at. And I think that my own opinion is I don't think we have enough data today to actually make this decision, and I pass. Thank you, Governor. Chairman Roberts? Anything else? No? Governor McDivitt? Governor Parker? Governor Duncan? Governor Temple? No. Governor Stavros? Governor Martin? Just one last question. What would be the effective date of this for the next school term? Fall. 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 Yes. Seeing no additional debate, let me be clear. I've called on each governor because I know that if this passes, it was going to come up at the full board, and I thought we could just get the conversation done at the committee meeting and save a great deal of time in the afternoon. That said, it seems as though we have some differing opinions on the board, and as a result, Mikey, I'm going to need to know which members of the board are on this committee as we take this vote. Do you want me to call the vote by member of the committee? Yes. By member of the committee? Okay. And let's be clear what the final motion is, is the motion that Governor Edwards put forth as amended to include 70 percent of the revenues to hire and retain faculty, including related administrative support costs, which would include the counselors Governor Martin was talking about, with 30 percent of the increased revenue dedicated. Okay. I'll go by member. Yes or no? Yes? Yes. Okay. Mr. Stasper? I oppose. Ms. Duncan? Opposed. Mr. Edwards? Yes. Mr. Devin? Yes. Mr. Mosley? No. Mr. Pappas? No. Excuse me? 
No. Mr. Smith is not here. Mr. Temple? Yes. Dr. Zachariah? I'm a member. Yes, you are a member of the committee. Mr. Chairman, you have a tie and can break the tie. I will vote yes to move this forward to the full board meeting, and then Chair Roberts can deal with the issue. Zach, are you walking later today? We still have a great deal of agenda to cover, however, before we before we break for lunch. Madam Chair, let me let me defer to you and ask you if you'd like to. I think we probably have another 10 minutes of this meeting. Would you like us to finish this meeting and then break for lunch? Would you like us to? I know we've been sitting here now for about two hours. If you will please continue this meeting, we will break and then go after the break to a short of student affairs and then into the general meeting. Who's passing out the word? All right then. We have a myriad of regulations to talk about and to adopt. Tim, would you do this, Chris, as quickly as we can? Mr. Chair, did you want to talk a little bit about the action that came from the Strategic Planning Committee? Thanks. I am certainly happy to do that. As you recall, this morning the Strategic Planning Committee had charged or requested our committee to take care of certain elements of the Strategic Plan. There were three elements in particular of the Strategic Plan we've been asked to address. Number one. For us to address the charge of the belt to develop for approval by the full board by the June 2008 meeting, a set of principles that will inform the LBR and the board's tuition policy going forward. Number two, to request that the budget committee address changes developing for the development and approval for the full board of June 2008 meeting a policy statement on funding university system growth and a method for allocating enrollment growth funding. And three, that the Chancellor report at the next meeting on the potential to include incentive funding in university compacts. Those are the issues we've been asked to address. The Chancellor has appointed a working group on the forward by design plan. That working group includes several of our university presidents together with staff, and we are asking them to take these elements of the plan. Chris, uh, Chris Tim, if you'll remind us who's on the working group to take those elements of the plan with some input that we're going to have throughout that process and report back to us, the Budget Committee, so we can forward that report on to the full board. Tim, the working group is whom? The working group includes Florida State, Florida A&M, University of West Florida, and Florida Atlantic. Together with staff, and then we'll have some other input on additional thoughts that we may want to consider during that process. Thanks, Tim. Any questions? All right. Tim, will you run us through the, re the uh, regulations, please? Yes, the first regulation is amended regulation 9.019 dealing with the major gift matching program. Uh, this takes the existing regulation and incorporates a lot of the existing policy guidelines into the regulation. And we've had briefings with foundation directors and CAFA members, and we believe they are in full support of this. Any questions? We've been fully briefed on that resolution. Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Regulation carries. Next one, Tim. Oh, Chris. Oh, Nate. Chris. 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 Sorry. Thank you, Governor Fred. Sorry, Nate. It's you. And it's your pleasure. Would you like these are all related to university procurement? Yeah. If you, you like could deal with them all at once and we can dispatch yes. them in one motion, that would be great. In brief, for the record, the, what we are doing here is conforming regulations. The all the repeals are the existing set of regulations. The new regulations, the 1801, 0203, simplify in this order, makes it easier, I believe, to follow again. As Tim pointed out, these have all been vetted with the universities, and we believe there's general acceptance of these regulations. And this is, of course, just notice to amend, so we will have the period for comment from you know, any interested parties. And I'll be glad to take any questions. Any questions? Seeing none, do we need it? We don't need approval of the notice to amend. We're simply providing the notice to amend. I am not. That's Mikey. Mikey, these are, we, this is a notice to amend. This is not our amendment vote. So this is the first round that does not require our approval. Just by the board, that's 
sounds like we would. Okay, uh, I, that sounds to me like we have to vote with that. Okay, so we've been presented and briefed on the notice to intend to create bog regulations with regard to purchasing procedures. Any questions on any of those? I Governor move. Pappas. I move the proposal. Move approval. Second. 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 Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of B, Roman 1, 2, and 3. Uh, moving to notice to amend. Please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Thank you. That carries. Chris, are you still up? And that took care of the repeals? That took B, 1, 2, and 3. We did not do C at all. Okay. Then we just have the C repeals. Notice to repeal. Okay. I would move the um, re repeal regulations as well. There's a second. Motion in the second to approve the notice of intent to repeal regulations contained under C, Roman 1 through 9. Any discussion or questions? Seeing that all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, as we close, and before we close, I want to say this was a hard meeting. We made some tough decisions at this meeting, and we've asked the universities to make some tough decisions. I don't think any of us are taking this lightly, and, you know, it's just it's a very tough time. It's a very tough time in the system. We've, we have to make a choice of quality over quantity at some point in time. We're asking the legislature to step up. And as a result, we need to do our share through realistic cuts, enrollment policies, and passing the burden along. And it's it's a difficult thing, and I, I appreciate the Budget Committee working so hard and spending the time to get that done today. If there's nothing else, we'll stand adjourned. Now, uh, launch is